yeah, I, I never imagined selling my art or doing it as a business. At that point, I just loved it, knew I wanted to do something that had to do with art, probably assumed that I would go back and get a teaching degree if that's how it was going to go. And so uh, just one thing at a time, that's, that's what I did. Hey, Al Anderson, welcome to episode 128 of the Kamena Voice. Today, I'm here with the featured artist of the month for February. Please welcome Allison Lewis. Hi, I'm Brandon Erickson, and you're listening to the Kamano Voice podcast, where I interview folks around Kamano Island and beyond. If you want to stay up to date on events, businesses, and even hear a little history of this area, subscribe to this podcast and share with your friends. Thanks for listening. Hey, Islanders, and welcome back to another episode of the Commando Voice, where we release a new episode every Tuesday. Uh, how's your guys' week going? I hope it's going well. Uh, we've been having great sunny weather here over the last week, so um, I'm getting used to it, which is always a dangerous thing, because <laughs> then, then the rain comes right back. So, um, yeah, and uh, I hope you guys, this is coming out, actually, this is coming out, da, 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 da. Uh, middle of Glass Quest week. If you guys are part or aware of Glass Quest, uh, this is in 2022. So, for those future listeners of of this podcast, all three of you, um, uh, yeah. So it's of course a crazy week and um, exciting. There's lots of people running around. People that are here um, on vacation uh, that you know travel out here for this this event. Uh, if you haven't heard of Glass Quest, it's when people find these plastic clue balls. And if you find one, then you get one of the unlimited, the uh, not li- unlimited, the limited glass quest balls, which are blown glass by um, uh, uh, Mark and Marcus Ellinger, uh, and they just do a great job. They, there's actually an episode of that, so you can go back and listen to that. Um, anyways, crazy times here uh, on Camano Island in Stanwood. Um, happens every February, so if you haven't done it before, you should uh, come out and try it. Um, and we have a beautiful week, it looks like, for this glass quest. So um, I hope that the weather doesn't prove me wrong here. Um, anyways, enough on glass quest. Today I interview Allison Lewis, who is the fe- uh, featured artist on the month for the February of 2022. Um, so she's going to be up here in the loft. Uh, she's got her art on display. Uh, so be sure to come up and check it out. Um, I've been able to actually check out the display since it's up. And uh, it's so cool. Um, the the style of art, like what she was, describes in the podcast makes a lot more sense now. And uh, it's very unique. Um, I, I think it's really cool. And you guys are really going to enjoy coming up and checking it out. Um, and I love I love interviewing artists and finding out their artist journey and how do they get to where they are. Um, and um, so you'll see throughout this podcast just kind of the this, this journey that she takes to become an artist and, and then... Um, you know, at points along her life, and even now, sometimes she's like, I can't believe I'm an artist, <laughs> um, and I, I'm okay calling myself that, and so uh, it's really cool to be able to see that. Um, she's actually out of Kashmir, so a little bit farther away from here, um, but uh, we're glad that we were, that Lydia was able to get her in the loft, and so, yeah, without further ado, here's my conversation with Allison Lewis. Hey, Islanders, and welcome to another episode of the Kamena Voice. Today, I'm here with the featured artist of the month in the loft for February. Welcome to the podcast, Allison Lewis. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks for joining me. So before we get started, tell us a little bit about Allison. Sure. So I am from uh, Kashmir, Washington, which is on the other side of the mountains, and I grew up in East Wenatchee. If anyone has heard of the little Bavarian town of Leavenworth yes. over on the other side. Pretty big tourist destination <laughs> around Christmas time. So I'm about 10 minutes away from there and grew up in a town over from that also. And yeah, I'm married, have four kids, um, school age. And yeah, we love it over there. Nice. The Very cool. Um, so you grew up over there. What was that like growing up uh, over there for you? Uh, it was a great childhood. I'm really thankful. It was a lot smaller than, or it feels like it was a lot smaller to me. Um, there were so many more orchards. It's a pretty, used to be more agricultural, has 
a lot of the orchards have left and more businesses moved in, but um, it's still kind of known as the apple capital of the world. I don't know if you've heard of heard of that around Wenatchee. Um, yeah. I grew up kind of in a house surrounded by orchards, so that was pretty special small town feel. Um, yeah, just appreciating nature and going on hikes a lot. And um, my parents really just encouraged being out in nature and, and doing artistic, any kind of endeavor I had, I was really thankful to be supported that way in, in the arts. So, yeah. Nice. So, uh, growing up in the orchard and stuff, like as kids, would you guys, do you guys get, uh, were you able to kind of like run through the orchards and, and hang out throughout them or are they pretty well guarded? Oh, sure. Yeah. It was, it was easy to run through. We, <laughs> we by no means were, we weren't running them. We just lived right next to them, but yeah, it was pretty low key. We could, we could run through them, pick, cherries in the summer they'd let us do that that was pretty sweet that's great so did you work the field and stuff like that once you got old enough um in high school i worked in a warehouse one time okay sorting cherries the summer that's kind of the thing thing to do in high school for sure a summer job so um yeah a lot of a lot of my friends did that i'm really thankful for knowing a little bit more about how that whole industry and um yeah agriculture works in in wenatchee so Nice. I'm thankful for that. And I'm now just remembering, is Kashmir where uh, Applets and Cotlets was at? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep. Cool. So what was that like growing up in that area? For what, Did you guys visit there a lot, or was that something that came up a lot? Actually, no. It was such, It was a really, well, I guess it's still a really small town, but for some reason, I just, we never went out there much um, growing up. And I think as Leavenworth's gotten more tourist mm-hmm. destination, I think Kashmir is kind of along that that line, I guess. And yeah, Appleton and Cotless, we'd go out there once in a while for okay. that. But, um, yeah, we've been in our house 17 years, I think. Wow. So it's, we've seen cashmere grow quite a bit. It's a really sweet place to raise a family. I'm really thankful. So yeah. a lot of orchards still there. Yeah. So they kind of have left the Wenatchee area and thankfully there's still a lot in cashmere. So that's how I, I get a lot of inspiration from looking out at the orchards and the mountains around. Nice. So. Yeah, I remember um, when we had some of the forest fires and things like that over the last, well, five to ten years, there's been some crazy ones that have just devastated orchards and, For sure. sub, you know, even the, like, mm-hmm. warehouses and stuff like that. Like, it was crazy when we were driving back one time, seeing all the different places. Definitely. So. It's been pretty crazy the last few years with fires. I don't remember that growing up yeah. at all, but it's, yeah, that's been quite a quite a feat last few years to get through that yeah (laughs) every summer it seems like people hold their breath about whether they're going to be forest fires coming through so yeah no it's definitely um it is one of those things uh that feels like growing up i didn't remember hearing that many like i can't think of any like major major ones um at least growing up that were right that would hit that often and now it is it's like every year it feels like there's another big round and um, I'm always like, there can't be that much more to burn because it just burned <laughs> through. But, um, yeah. So, it is pretty amazing. So, um, very cool. So then, um, you grew up in, uh, uh, East Wenatchee. Then, um, did you guys go to Leavenworth a lot growing up or like that area, like through hikes and stuff like that? Uh, we just hiked various places around the Northwest, not usually directly in the area. We'd go to Idaho or, um, the west side or up in Canada a bit or not a whole lot, but we did camping trips and hiking and whatnot. So yes, probably Leavenworth. Uh, that was, it wasn't too big of a tourist destination at all. We'd go up there, you know, once or twice a summer when friends visit, that's where you take them. But, uh, yeah, it was nothing <clears throat> like it is now. It's, yeah. It's another world now. <laughs> yeah. We're, so bef- cause Leavenworth, if I'm correct, it, kind of was more of a um like it was a small touristy ish town but Mm -hmm. more hodgepodge and not as like definitely put together did you guys get to kind of see that transformation of when they came through and they were like all right let's make this our theme and and all that uh well i think it's always been a bavarian theme they built on that i believe in the late late 60s early 70s Mm -hmm. and it's always been that theme but i think it's definitely grown a hundred times more commercial and they've really done a classy job. I feel like yeah. of, uh, creating that atmosphere, but it's, <clears throat> it's beautiful. Yeah. I, yeah. I do love living by there. Yeah. Well, the, uh, the times, um, 
as a kid when I went to Leavenworth. I always felt like it feels like you're walking into, and this might come out as a negative, but like feels like you're walking like a Christmas Hallmark movie. Like uh-huh. <laughs> it's exactly what you would picture their town to feel like. It is. Um, and uh, so I just like, there's the skiing hill, there's snow on the ground, there's everything is decorated like perfectly. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, so I always loved going visiting there during the Christmas time. Definitely. Um, so, and it wasn't until I was uh, in college that we actually went there during the summer. And I was like, oh, there's stuff to do here during the summer. I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Year-round, for sure. There's never yeah. a break in, cr- in crowds, it seems like. If I have to run errands up there or do something in Leavenworth, it's just always busy. And that, you know, the locals don't appreciate that <laughs> as much. But I still, I think it's beautiful. The only, the hardest part is parking. There's really not much parking at all. So right. the busier it gets in the bottleneck streets. But, yeah, I can understand why people want to come over. So. Yeah. Very yeah. cool. All right. So then um, you went to school and did you, were you homeschooled or were you, did you go to public school over there? I went to public school mm-hmm, okay. and went to Whitworth for two years. And then uh, trans- I was a music ed major and decided, took one art class and I'd always loved art growing up and being in that, but didn't have a lot of chance in high school to study that. You only have a, ma- a certain amount of electives. And mm-hmm. so I didn't try art class much until college and just fell in love with it, knew I needed, wanted to do that, and then transferred to University of Washington for the rest of college to get a BA in visual arts. And okay. super thankful again for parents that didn't think I was crazy <laughs> to get an art major uh, when I didn't know what I wanted to do with that. And um, I, I don't, it's okay if I keep going yeah, on this. Yeah, for but, sure. Uh, yeah, I, I never imagined selling my art or doing it as a business. At, at that point, I just loved it, knew I'd wanted to do something that had to do with art, probably assumed that I would go back and get a teaching degree if that's how it was going to go. And so, uh, just one thing at a time, that's, that's what I did. Um, I think I'm answering your question. And after college, um, I got married to my husband, moved back to the area that we're in now. And, um, yeah, I did get a teaching degree, but never ended up using that right away. Just had kids. So put art on the back burner and, so that's, that's the story there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, so you, you graduated and then got married pretty soon after then. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep. So then, um, was it something where like, were you guys waiting to like maybe have kids and try and take that farther or, or did kids just happen right away? And it was kind of like, all right, we're going to just put this on the back burner. Uh, we, I think we we had been married five years, four or five years. So, yeah, I, I worked at a junior high actually as a piano accompanist for a couple of years. And okay. And then, then went back to school and got my teaching degree. And then by that point, I was subbing a bit. And then we started having a family. So Okay. Yeah. Nice. So um, as you went uh, – and then as your kids got older, when did you start kind of picking up uh, art again? Right. So we had them at home, and I stayed home with the kids till – just about three years ago, I think. And then just, I I can't even pinpoint exactly when, but just started doing art more and re, <clears throat> redid my studio in our house. We just have a room set up for that. And I um, got to rework some things in there and reorganize, started spending more time in there, inviting the kids in to do art with me. And um, it was getting a little easier because they were getting older and uh, could do more on their own. So I just had more time to do that. And once they... Uh, had just a series of inspiration, trying new media and trying uh, this watercolor mixed media process I got into and other other things um, and having more time. And the kids ended up going to public school. So that just opened up time to pursue it as a business. Yeah. So, yeah, I just started creating and then for fun put it on social media and people started wanting to buy it and then I thought oh this could be a thing so <laughs> um yeah I just started that business a couple years ago with, with my husband so very cool so when you started getting back into it um what did everything kind of come back pretty easily and stuff <laughs> um yeah I don't think I think creating you know all your life just it's just part of who you are, whether you're picking it up or not. So I guess like riding a bike, definitely. Um, and picking it up again, I guess things that I had read and different artists that I've followed and just, um, changing as a person, I wanted to explore different 
mediums and styles and just found that I really enjoyed more abstract painting and okay. um, just breaking it personally for me. I think growing up, uh, I guess the goal more creating something that looks like something else or photorealism or that the goal is to um, just from where I had studied and where I'd come from, that that was more, I guess, valued and I hadn't mm-hmm. pursued the abstract side of things. And so just in a different spot in life and feeling more freedom to explore and um, experiment with different artistic medium and style. And so, yes, I think I'm getting off track. What what was your question? (laughs) Um, Well, that actually makes me wonder. So like, what was, how did you kind of determine, I guess back in college, what was kind of your medium that you were utilizing there? And then how has that changed? Sure. So in college, my BA was in figure drawing. Um, and more Conti charcoal, uh, drawing that kind of thing. And just started playing with watercolor and mixed media process. And I loved printmaking in college, but I never pursued that. And I think that kind of plays into my landscape style and different things I'm doing now with mixed media. It has like printmaking influence, even though I'm not using that process, but it kind of informs the one I'm using now so okay what um for our listeners and myself what is the print form media what's that kind of what oh, does that print mean making? print making print making yes. oh, well there are many different types of print making but the ones that i had practiced i think are mono printing and you just make a singular um design out of different um, mediums and run a plate through and it has one um one print that you come out with or a linoleum cut or a wood block print that you carve into the rubber or the wood and material and then you lay paper over it with you rub the ink on it um, with different tools and then lay the paper and you run it through a press or um, uh, create a print that way and peeling the paper off okay and you'll see a lot of cards and prints now probably you'll be able to tell their distinct fine crisp lines usually in wood block prints or linoleum cut prints um and so that just fascinated me and uh opposite process is what I do in mine where I apply a glue type medium and then watercolor over that and then when I remove the glue medium it has the same crisp lines in there that can look similar to printmaking but okay. it's the opposite process of applying something and removing it so okay very cool. How did you kind of come across that that type or style? Um, I honestly have never seen that before. I was just in the art store picking up supplies and just grabbed this uh, this glue medium, and I just had an idea in mind. I hadn't seen anybody do that, so I honestly don't know if <laughs> if many people are doing that, but just playing with the mediums. Yeah. So. Very cool. So then, um, so walk us through a little bit of that process of what that. Uh, creating a piece looks like for you? Uh, Usually I have landscapes in mind that I just either hike to or that just inspire me. I try to only paint a piece that I've been to and experienced. Uh, So take a photograph or just go to the place and um, have take pictures there on site and then bring them back to my studio and uh, sometimes I'll draw it out first, uh, small scale, or I'll just start in on a piece and paint that with the glue medium and let it dry and then watercolor paint around it and then let that dry and then remove move the glue. And sometimes I'll go back with different color and medium on top of that. So okay. if that's what you're asking. Yeah, yeah, that's very cool. So are you, what are you... Um I guess, what are you gluing to? Is it that like a canvas or is oh, it Oh, I'm a... sorry. Watercolor paper. Okay. Use watercolor paper. Mm-hmm. Got it. Okay. And the glue doesn't damage the paper as it is removed or? Um, sometimes it's tricky process to remove oh, wait, it without <laughs> pulling, it, pulling it out way, but different tools to remove it. Um, yeah. Different special erasers or, yeah. Very cool. It sounds very stressful to me. I'd be like, <laughs> after you've done all this other stuff, then you're like, okay, now slowly remove the paper, the glue part. <laughs> Yeah, it's pretty sturdy, specific watercolor paper, too. It's not just normal, thin water, watercolor okay. paper. So. Nice. Cool. What drew you to watercolor as your uh, painting medium? Um, really getting into to these two um, <clears throat> different styles that I'm focused on now with the watercolor was just the images that I started 
being inspired to want to paint. I just knew I that was the only medium that work for okay. what I was seeing in my yeah. mind. <laughs> yeah, so. that's great. Um, with um, this is a complete side note, but it's something I've interviewed a few different artists now, and every time they say the word charcoal, I always imagine them. <laughs> drawing with like a big chunk of wood that's just charcoalized and drawing and I'm like that seems so difficult (laughs) well I have tried that before but that's not what I was using (laughs) oh it's usually it's called Conti too is like a hard pressed charcoal okay more like a pastel colors okay or black and and white um there are different thicknesses and different soft to hardness that you can buy, but okay. usually it's the harder Conti, Conti pastel. So okay, yeah, nice. They're thin little sticks. Okay, that you use. <laughs> it's not a big hunk of wood. <laughs> uh, so, um, so when you're talking about like um, so abstract versus kind of more, you know, scene oriented or things like that, what kind of drew you to the abstract side? Hmm, that's a good question. I think just after, personally for me, just after years of, I think doing what I maybe saw others doing or in school, it was just what you're trained on the skill of it. Once you have the skills and the training, just it's hard to, I think, break out of that, Mm -hmm. I guess, um, from my experience. And then valuing that uh, to break away and just valuing your res- artistic response to something or your expression of mm-hmm. it rather than just trying to achieve a look of something. I don't know if that makes sense. So yeah. being more inspired of the the emotion and capturing the colors and how I want to feel when I'm looking at the painting and yeah. what I'm trying to express. So I think just finding more freedom in that and just the actual process is more freeing to do it abstractly and mm-hmm. s- sometimes just see what happens. I can have an idea in my mind, but if I'm actually trying to make something look exactly like the photograph that I'm looking at is yeah. just washes all of the fun and artistic <laughs> process for me. Yeah. Just personally. Yeah. Well, I, I think I love that explanation too of, um, because <clears throat> when you see a sunset, especially on Camino, um, or in the Northwest, you see these beautiful sunsets or you see the mountains or you see these things that, uh, you know, I'll pull up, you know, I've got an iPhone, I'll pull out my camera, take a picture. And like, you look at the picture, like, well, that's not really what you feel or see when you see that. Like it's, it's a representation, but it's not truly it. And that idea of trying to paint more the, create the emotional feel that you feel when you see that rather than the exact imagery of what you see. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's really cool. That's a great way to kind of explain that. Mm -hmm. Um, when you, when you're looking at other people's art and stuff, do you tend to go more towards other artists that are doing the abstract side or do you kind of focus on the other side? Hmm. For what I would personally want in my home. Yeah. Or, or if you go through a gallery or something. Sure. I have to honestly say I really, I really truly enjoy looking at all of it. I can completely appreciate the detailed paintings because I, I, I know that's so difficult and I can respect that. And I visually appreciate it and like what I'm seeing. Mm-hmm. But I love, I love abstract work too. I think it, it just all inspires me. I don't know what other artists might feel about that, but especially walking through the commons or just anywhere walking through an art gallery just inspires me even if something seems like harsh or I don't I don't understand it just makes me feel invited to figure it out and yeah. just pursue it and ask questions I just find it fascinating no matter what style yeah. art it is nice so not really maybe the answer of preference that you wanted but yeah I just it all inspires me I yeah. think so no, that's, I, yeah, and I, the reason I asked that question is because, and if you talk to Lydia about this, she'll tell you, um, I always struggle, I mean, my background's engineering, so very scientific, <laughs> okay. you know, fact, data, uh-huh. all that, um, so a lot of times when I look at abstract paintings, and I'm trying to get better, but like, I get so lost, and I'm like, I don't, I don't really get this. <laughs> 
I completely understand. My husband's an engineer. He is a civil engineer. And that has been a fun part of our marriage, too, <laughs> is that he was not in any way interested in art. I think he would confess to this. <laughs> so it was pretty amusing. Opposites attract, for sure, sometimes. <laughs> so as the engineer major, it was definitely a new thing to be dating an art major. And he has grown a lot. He'll even go to galleries with me now and not probably not prefer anything he sees, but is willing to go. So, yeah. and he really is good and he is my biggest cheerleader. So it's, it's fun. I think to have different perspectives. Yeah. <laughs> sure. That's awesome. Yeah. No, we've, we've, we've had artists that are <laughs> abstract that I've looked at and I'm like, I, I'm confused. <laughs> and so Lydia now will very purposely like be like, Brandon, this is, this is something I think you would really enjoy. And I'll be like, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, very cool. Um, so, um, so then as you've kind of grown, um, you said you started in uh, a few years ago, what was it like for you then to really step out and decide, okay, I'm going to try and make this, turn this into a business. What was that like for you? Uh, it happened really fast and was like being on a roller coaster. It was really scary in a way cause I did not know what I was doing, but I could not have done it with my, out my husband, um, definitely, but really exciting. I mean, I, I can't even tell you how exciting it is because I, I just never anticipated doing art as, as a business. As, I think it's totally different nowadays. You know, 30 years ago in college, I just didn't personally know many artists trying to make a living at that. It was just few and far between, and if you get your art in a official gallery, then that was kind of the only option that I saw at that point, really, or being yeah. an art professor. And now just with social media and everything moving to online and just so many computer graphics, there's just so many avenues, Etsy, et cetera, so many places to have and host your art. And for people to see it is just a totally different ballgame. I, I don't think that I could be doing it without that so yeah um that was opened up at just the right time I feel like really thankful for just the timing of pursuing it I guess so yeah. it happened really fast and super exciting and a weird thing as an artist to say yes I'm an artist and not be afraid to say that <laughs> <laughs> you know it's just a weird thing that we do yeah so that's great so um when you started uh, or I guess not when you um what was it like then? Um, cause you had started doing this and really pursuing it and then 2020 hits and it kind of shuts everything down. What was that like? Did you feel like defeated at that time or did you, did you, did it redouble your efforts in that? Um, I can honestly say, I don't think it slowed a whole lot down because so much is online. I feel like <clears throat> my learning, I'm in an art mentoring program, um, with Lydia. Okay. Uh, and, it was, it's just so inspiring. And a lot of that's online. And I think, um, uh, community engagement with the artistic community is on there and a lot of mentoring. And so the learning aspect just to keep motivated and stay in the loop and not feel isolated, I guess that way. And then putting my art out, you know, social media is still available as far as the markets and getting out in the public. I think, that was definitely challenging, but I mm -hmm. saw my community find ways to make that happen, even just masked or put off, you know, to a later date. But it still happened during the year. It's definitely slowed down, but we actually saw our community really in the things that were hosted and happened were just um, that year business-wise and and just financially. People just wanted to support local artists and local businesses. It was really amazing. So yeah. I don't feel like it really hindered a whole lot and definitely challenged, I think, creative people to just take it as an opportunity to grow and either double down and, and spend time creating more at home, yeah. brainstorming, or um, and just preparing for the next season or just seeing how you can roll with it. We had friends that would just do online galleries. They would just host it out of their home or, you know, just transferring that pivoting so yeah it was really inspiring i think to see how people responded to that and and our community i know really did i was really thankful for that yeah. support so very cool is there a lot of um galleries and stuff in your community there are a couple in wenatchee in the larger town not 
any that I know of in my small little town, Kashmir, but in Wenatchee, there are a couple. And we have art walks on the first Friday of the month. So Okay. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> I was just actually talking to, uh, in another interview, to someone who said, um, you know, they were starting a, a their comedy career out and then, like, the pandemic and everything. And they said they looked at it as an opportunity because these master comedians that they had looked up to were had free time. And so they started like some online classes and Mm -hmm. tutor, you know, they would do these things that they would never have done had there not been that, you know, pandemic. And Mm -hmm. so, um, it's really in the outlook of how you look at things and people have Mm -hmm. decided either it's over, like I can't make it through, or they, they looked at the opportunity of, look, I have access to people that I would never have had access to Mm -hmm. prior to this. And so, um, for sure. Yeah, I think it's really neat how people have adapted to all of this. So mm-hmm. nice. So <clears throat> um, looking ahead for 2022 then and, and kind of beyond, um, what do you kind of see as your, your next steps? What's kind of your future as, as you continue to go on this journey? Hmm. Well, <laughs> I have a lot of dreams, I guess, that way, but really do not know what is in store. I feel I feel like it's just beginning. I'm just – I'm open to whatever happens next, I guess, just still pursuing the mediums I'm working in, but open to doing, finding more galleries and, um, developing relationships with people and doing more commission work. I love doing that. I love, um, meeting people and getting into their homes and painting from their perspective, from Mm -hmm. their, their home, their views, um, painting more, more landscapes around the Northwest are just, brings me a lot of joy and finding going to the places hiking to the places that I'll be painting with family or friends it's just inspiring but as far as maybe business wise I have no idea I'm just (laughs) along for the ride and really inspired every day to see what opportunity opens up because every year has been different yeah so yeah do you try um do you try out other different mediums like oil painting and other forms just to kind of see that perspective Mm -hmm, for sure I tried oil painting and have acrylics and, um, I've tried alcohol ink and gosh, I can't think now gouache and, um, really wanted to get into sculpture. I live two doors down from another artist, um, sculpture ist and she's amazing. They're amazing. And, um, really want to dig into that too and try that out this year. So very cool. What type of sculpture, like uh, stone? Um, no, just freeform clay building okay. and then bronze casting and yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Nice. Very cool. And do you feel like as you, you kind of expand in other different forms of art and stuff, does that when you go back to your base medium, do you feel like you have new creativity and new viewpoints? I think definitely I f- end up feeling more inspired and enjoy working with the medium that I'm I'm working in, but definitely um yeah, it definitely stretches me. Yeah. For sure. Nice. Okay, so tell us about the pieces that you're bringing to the loft for the show. I believe I have, um, do you mean the titles of them or just story? Uh, well, you yeah, if you have stories, that'd be oh, great. Well. <laughs> but if you have titles and... Uh, yeah, I think I have Mount Baker, Artist Point, and Blue Lake North Cascades, which is over by Winthrop. Okay. Um, let me see. Several from Plain, Washington. It's mm-hmm. just up in the mountains. And let me think. There's one Mount Rainier I just finished. So, yeah. Okay. I think that that's all. It's kind of a, kind of a smaller wall, so that's all, that's all I could fit. Some of them are pretty large pieces. So Yeah. Mm-hmm. Nice. Cool. And, and um, so, like, when you do the – because you talked about doing the glue and stuff. So do you – glue out kind of the shape of the like like say like uh, mount baker would you glue out the shape of mount baker and then paint around that pretty much i try to see it and lay it out in positive negative space so where the light light is and different features so and then just adding into that just the abstract the lines that i find important when i look at it just um part of it's free flowing and then part of it's looking at the shapes and positive negative space okay Mm -hmm. Very cool. Well, I'm excited to see them all. Um, I saw a really quick glimpse when we were up there, but um, I'm, I'm excited to look at the wall when it's all put together. Um, all right. Well, awesome. I like to finish every podcast with some rapid fire questions. So the first one is, what purchase of $100 or less have you enjoyed the most in the last three months? 
Oh, wow. That's probably a tie. Can I say a few? Yeah. Oh, for sure. <laughs> um, I'd say the first one is honestly taking my sons out for a date on their own. Mm-hmm. That has been the sweetest thing. So they're teenagers. Two of them are um, just one-on-one. <clears throat> taking him out for breakfast has honestly been one of the best gifts this year. I just started nice. doing that. So um, I can honestly say that. And then... A fun Christmas present that we got our whole family were Universal Yums. Have you heard of that? No. It's so fun. Um, (laughs) Well, my husband and I like to travel, see new places and countries, and learn about cultures. And this is just a fun way to bring the kids into it. It's this box, almost shoe box size. Okay. Um, And you just get a subscription for the year. And every month it comes with a different country. Okay. That's the focus. And you have uh, like a trivia booklet and recipe suggestions and fun facts about the country and then different snacks and okay. little candy bars, different things from that country to focus yeah. on. And then we'll make dinner from that country that night, listen to music from it, just make it kind of educational fun. But yeah. And you're supposed to rate the what you like in the box. Some are weird, some are really good, but it's just a great conversation piece and learning about cultures. It's really one of my favorite things that we do as a family. So yeah, that's yeah. great. We did, um, we had, it was a different name, but it was a snack box from around the world. It didn't have all mm-hmm. the other stuff. It just had like, um, mainly candies, but a few different snack things from different countries and stuff like that. And that was, um, at, whenever we do travel or whatever, that's one of the first things I do is like go to the grocery store and just yes. see what types of snacks and weird things they have. Yes. So. That is fun. Nice. All right. Uh, who is the most influential person outside of your family in your life? Wow. That, that is a hard question. Now, or it's really simple. So I have to be honest. Um, yeah, personally for me, I can, I can think of a lot of encouraging friends and inspirational friends that um, give advice or I would go to, but I honestly have to say my best friend that pours into me is there every time I ask a question and, you know, has provided everything art wise, if I have any decisions and my best friend is honestly the person of Jesus. And I know that'll probably make some people feel uncomfortable, but I got to be true to myself. And, yeah. and that's really honestly for me, I couldn't be doing this without him where my inspiration comes from. So yeah, definitely. That's, nice. that's who it is for me. Very cool. How, how does that, as you do your art and everything, how does that influence how you're, you're seeing it and how you project it into your art? Yeah. Thanks for asking. Um, absolutely everything. Like really, I, this whole new change of the abstract and seeing things differently completely just was inspired by him really I mean I would wake up having dreams of what to paint next and in the day just keep getting these images and um, uh, I have another series of kind of inspirational art hand lettering different different things Um, also just keep getting flooded by these ideas and I, I think that he's influenced all my all my life but just in a different way the last few years and um definitely just how I'm seeing things and what I get excited about. And even in the process of doing it, I feel like I learn a lot and I connect to God that way and in nature. So kind of in every way, I feel like he influences that process. Yeah, that's awesome. All right. Um, So this next question is like a fill in the blank question. Mm -hmm. Uh, So the question is, I know this is weird, but I've always wanted to blank. (laughs) I did see this question before and I thought, oh my goodness, I thought about it for a long time and I can't think of anything too weird. I thought I should ask my husband, what have I said before that was so weird? I, I really can't think other than dreams I've had where I'm flying. I think it'd be really fun to fly, not on a plane, but just fly. Yeah. <laughs> be able to fly without a jet pack. Yes. Or anything. Uh, that's all I can think of. Yeah. No, that's great. Um, who is an interesting or fascinating person that I should interview next? Hmm. <clears throat> so does this have to be someone local or it can be Im- it can really be anywhere. Anybody. Yeah. Well, I would say the most interesting person that I know that 
would just be fun to listen to about anything is my original piano teacher. When I was <laughs> eight years old, I started piano, and I st we still are friends with her and know her now, but she's just a hoot and just one of the funnest people to be around. I'd love to hear how she answers all these things. But, okay. <laughs> but also, um, I would love... I would really, I haven't looked into it, but I would love to know the, um, I would love to hear you interview relatives of tribal people from the First Peoples on Camino Island, this mm. area. I'd love to know their history and what, yeah, just hearing from them about this area. Cause yeah. I don't know. Yeah, that'd, that'd be, be really, that'd be really fascinating because it's, um, we do have a lot of like, um, like a lot of the names of the areas mm -hmm. around, not just on Camino, but like, uh, you know, still Guamish and, mm -hmm. uh, Swinomish and you've got these names of tribes and stuff like that. But, um, yeah, I don't know a whole lot on the Camino side, but it was very active. I mean, there was a lot of fishing and mm -hmm. things like that. So, um, yeah, that would be great. Love I'll, have to hear to, a modern I'll have to look into that. Yeah, for sure. All right. <clears throat> and lastly, what piece of advice would you give your 20 year old self? <laughs> Oh, so many. <laughs> I think probably just to not not worry. I know we hear that a lot, but to not not worry and maybe the decisions that the big decisions in life and even the ones that you question a lot and think about looking back, either if we made the wrong decision, then it's stuff still worked out mm -hmm. and somehow you know, there's a, nothing's impossible to change. There's nothing beyond redemption. So I guess those things that I wish I'd chosen differently, it still works out in the end. It's still going to be okay. And the other decisions that I did make that I feel like were right, I wish I hadn't wasted all that time worrying. So yeah. I guess just to trust, trust your decision or once you make a decision, just let it go. Yeah. So that's very good. I think a lot of, um, younger people for sure. That's like, you've got these decision point marks of, um, end of high school. Like, what are you going to, where are you going to go to college? What do you want to do with the rest of your life? And that's, that's a big question for someone that's just out of high school. Like, okay, now choose something that you're going to do for the rest of your life and you mm -hmm. can't change it. At least that's how it's presented. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's a lot of, um, pressure to put on someone, especially that young. For sure. So that's very good. Well, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. Thank you. It was really fun. Yeah, it was great having you. And Islanders, I will talk to you on the next one. Well, a big thank you to Allison Lewis for joining me on the podcast today. And thank you for listening. If you haven't already, be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to our podcast on your favorite podcast platform. It really helps us be found by other Islanders like yourself. For more information on this episode, you can go to minocommons.com slash podcast. That's minocommons.com slash podcast. Thanks for listening and see you next time.